Did a 2013 direct-to-video animated movie do a better job at telling the Flashpoint story than the latest $220 million DC film? That's what we're talking about on today's episode of Ink Cinema. And it starts right now. Aloha and welcome back to my channel. My name is Jake and this is Ink Cinema. Today we're talking The Flash. As I recap and review this movie, I'll be making a liner cut of Ezra slash Barry. Stick around to the end to see how it turns out. Also, big news, I've decided to rename this show Make Cinema. I'm constantly looking for new ways to create, and I've never been one who's comfortable in a box. I love experimenting with new mediums when I make art, and I started this series as Rug and Review, where I talk about a movie while I tufted rugs. I did that for a year, and then I discovered printmaking. Now, I'm playing with cyanotypes, aka sun printing, and on the next episode, bringing back an old hobby of mine all the way back from 2020, embroidery. I'm gonna mash mediums and methods together or do them separately. I'm gonna go wherever the flow takes me. I'm an adult with ADHD after all, and I want to make sure to give myself room to play while also keeping some sense of direction. One thing that is constant though is that I'll always be making something. I want to give this show a title that encompasses the art I create without restricting future me. It keeps the door open for anything I want to try in the future, and I love that it has a double meaning that'll inspire artists of all kinds, but especially filmmakers, to continue making great film. Thanks for listening, now let's get back to the show. I want to remind the viewer that when I develop my opinion of the movies that I see, I lead with the way that it makes me feel. That comes before anything I say about the cinematography, the music, or the performances. This conversation contains nuance, and I won't be able to get to all of it. There are a lot of opinions swirling online about this movie, and a lot of them take an extreme stance. So I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that this is a complicated conversation, and a movie is more than just good or bad. On the show, I try my best to focus on the positive while also analyzing what I thought didn't work or could have been better. There's an overabundance of negative critical voices on this platform and on Twitter. And I wanna celebrate and appreciate film without just tearing it down. With that said, there's a lot to break down in this movie and I appreciate all the work that was put into it. Thank you to the hundreds of people that put their all into this movie. Ultimately, I think The Flash suffers from a weak foundation, which vibrates through all of its other elements. As for pronouns, Ezra Miller has said in the past they accept they, them, and he, him, so I'll be using both in this video. Directed by Andy Muschietti, The Flash is a bright, messy, and controversial addition to the dwindling DCEU. It's a movie that never quite nails down what it's trying to be. Barry Allen uses super speed to change the past, but his attempt to save his family creates a world without superheroes, forcing him to race for his life in order to save the future. For this movie, director of It and It Chapter 2's Andy Muschietti teams up with Bumblebee and Birds of Prey writer Christina Hodson. Story by Joby Harold, who worked on a movie I just talked about in the last episode, Transformers Rise of the Beasts. The Flash has received a cinema score of B, and although a B in school isn't a bad thing, it is when it comes to film scores. A movie's cinema score grade is calculated by polling moviegoers at major movie releases on opening night. On Rotten Tomatoes, it's sitting at a critical score of 65% based on 332 reviews and an audience score of 84%. As of the weekend ending June 18th, 2023, The Flash has done $87 million domestically, and adding that figure to the international box office sales, it has done $210 million worldwide. The movie had an approximate budget of $220 million before marketing, so this movie would have to make a lot more to turn a profit which I highly doubt it will do at this point. As the numbers make it apparent, Warner Brothers will be losing money on this movie. Spoiler warning, this review contains spoilers for several important plot points and cameos. Whether you watch my review or not, I don't necessarily recommend for you to run out and go see this movie. I'm also not actively saying that you shouldn't see it. In fact, if you haven't seen it, go see it and form your own opinion. This is mine. I left the theater feeling physically uncomfortable. I was confused, underwhelmed, and disappointed. I tried lowering my expectations prior to watching because I knew the reviews coming out of CinemaCon were dramatic. I also wanted to trust James Gunn when he said it was one of the best superhero movies he's ever seen. This coming from the guy whose number one is Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. He's worked on Suicide Squad, Guardians, and now is the co-head of DC Studios, so he's a reliable voice, right? 
It's hard because I admire James so much and I do believe that he thought it was good, but it's advantageous for him to overhype it to ensure the security of his future and that of the new DCU. After all, they spent 220 mil plus marketing on this movie, and DC in general needs a big win. But with that amount of money, you'd think the CGI would be better. Come on now, more on that later. Starting off, I liked the chemistry between Barry and Nora Allen. Their emotional arc felt tangible. I thought Maribel Verdu did a fantastic job as Nora Allen. She made the character feel like we've met her before and even gotten to know her. The scene where Barry says goodbye to his mom was the best scene in the film by far. Sasha Kai's portrayal of Supergirl. Loved the wet hair look. Served body. Who is the body? Kara is the body. She brought a freshness to this movie that DC needed, but unfortunately, I don't think they have plans to bring her back in the future. Bringing Michael Keaton in was a decision. He's an exquisite actor, and I'm sure it was so fun for him to step back into a role he hasn't touched since the early 90s. A Batman movie featuring Michael Keaton could have made a killing on the nostalgia alone. That would have been iconic, especially for a summer movie. That's what should have happened. What also should have happened is releasing Batgirl which also starred Keaton, which would have given us even more reason to be invested in his character in this movie. But I also understand that The Flash was delayed for years and no one at DC was trying to make another solo Batman movie, especially after the release and success of Matt Reeves' The Batman. The Flash was originally slated for 2018, so it's wild that they even continued to pursue this idea, let alone release it in the summer of 2023 right after Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. I do have an idea for how they could have better utilized Michael Keaton, which I'll tell you about a little later. I liked the George Clooney scene. Leaving Ezra's Barry in an alternate timeline might open the door to leave him there, which is what they should do. This should be Ezra's final performance as Barry Allen. I mean, he was cast in 2014, almost 10 years ago, and if they're going to do away with Henry Cavill, the only one who can truly embody Superman, then... They should do away with Ezra too. I liked the choices that Henry Bram, the director of photography, made. He's a fantastic cinematographer who's worked on Guardians alongside James Gunn, and I can't wait to see what he does on Superman Legacy in 2025. Speaking of Superman Legacy, it was announced today, June 27th, that David Sweat will be playing Clark Kent slash Superman, and Rachel Brosnahan will be playing Lois Lane in Superman Legacy, which will apparently be out in theaters July 11th, 2025. Barry saved the therapy dog. Too many movies senselessly kill animals. You know that's one of my biggest pet peeves. So it was nice to see a hero actively saving an animal for once, even if that animal was recklessly CGI'd. The score by Benjamin Wallfish was brilliant, and I believe it outpaced the action happening on screen. It's sonically more sophisticated than what we were being shown. Grand, quirky, magnificent. An ode to classic superhero movies while also lacing in iconic sounds like Danny Elfman's Batman theme. He just got it. I liked Barry going back and putting the tomatoes on a higher shelf, so his father had to look up into the security camera, which ultimately vindicated him. It was a sweet moment. This storyline of the father in prison and Barry trying to get him out doesn't happen in the Flashpoint storyline normally, but I liked the addition here. Although, it rolls right over the message of this movie. Don't mess with the past, because even that, changing a small moment in history, will cause unknown ripple effects across space-time. So it's wild that he even did this, considering how much Barry just went through to realize that his actions have consequences. What I didn't like, let's just cut to the fucking chase, the CGI. It started off on the wrong foot from the beginning, the running, the babies, it just didn't work. Keep an eye on the visual effects channel Corridor Crew because they'll do a better job at explaining why it didn't work. I mean, I've seen video game cutscenes that were better than the PS2 situation we got at times in this movie. There is good CGI in it, but it's like negative comments that stand out amongst the positive ones. The negative is the one you remember. The CGI that I liked was when the lightning goes through present Barry and hits past Barry, as well as any slow-mo lightning effects like what Zack Snyder did in his cut of Justice League, because it works when it's done right. The Chrono Bowl was way too much. The director even tried to save face and say it was intentionally supposed to look like that because it was from Barry's POV, but if I were Barry 
and I saw that, I'd be terrified. Okay, I'd be like, am I in a video game? Am I in Spy Kids 3D? It was too much all at once. The film strip planets are cool in theory, but in execution, they were overwhelming. And to have them different colors, high infinity stones colliding in midair, I get it. It's a visualization of all these timelines getting fucked as a result of Barry saving his mom. But it just shouldn't make you think this hard. Now let's talk about the CGI cameos for a second. Christopher Reeve, Adam West, George Reeves, actors who couldn't consent to using their image. This brings up moral and ethical issues we need to start thinking about as the rise of AI and deepfake technology continues to develop. It should even go as far as SAG-AFTRA fighting on behalf of actors to make sure that this doesn't happen again. The irony is that the newest season of Black Mirror came out the same day as The Flash, which contains an episode about the harmful effects of deepfake technology. The biggest example of this abuse of power surrounds George Reeves, who died by suicide in 1959 after playing Superman on television in Adventures of Superman. This role haunted him for the rest of his life. It was something he couldn't escape and ultimately was a large part of why he took his own life. It's extremely disrespectful to his legacy and his family to put him in this movie. There's a lot more that could be said, but I'll leave it at that for now. There's also so much archival footage of Superman, Batman, The Flash, and yet we decided to digitally reconstruct an actor's face. Just a very strange decision to me. The artists were just following their orders, so it isn't their fault. It's Andy's. Nicolas Cage gets his moment, but he's alive and well, so why couldn't we use his actual face? And now the cherry on top is that I read something about them having this man come in so the VFX people could use the footage as reference to sculpt him in post. This makes the situation even worse. You had the man live and in person and still didn't just shoot him in a super suit? Okay, I roll. One of the biggest things I have a problem with is the core of the story. It missed the mark in my opinion and didn't carefully capture the Flashpoint story. That's where most of this movie's problems stem from. More on this in the final part of the video. The character of Barry is annoying. In both iterations, past and present, just annoying. Also, hate that they didn't include Ray Fisher's cyborg. I get that Warner Brothers had had issues with him in the past, but considering he was the victim in the situation, they should have at least included footage they've already shot of him. Because every other member of the Justice League made an appearance. So it's fucked up that they didn't include him. He's never been supported or protected by Warner Brothers, and yet Ezra is. The humor? Questionable. Some jokes were literally childish. Barry said shit so many times, just cause, and the dick jokes girl. Christina loves a dick joke. I love a dick joke, but they pushed hard for us to imagine what Ezra is working with under there. Why? because we already see most of his ass in this movie, and that's the one thing we don't get. Yet, they talked about it so much. Oh, it's just a cringe fest. But that ending, hated it. And then the post credit scene, pure comedy. Little on the nose for Ezra, I'd say. Barry having to take care of a drunk Aquaman who collapses in a puddle. Hmm, reminds me of when Ezra choked a fan behind a dumpster. Hmm, art imitating life? Why this movie doesn't work in 2023. As for the writing, you've got to be a fan of comic books in order to pull off a movie like this. The production has been delayed for years, so there was plenty of time to dive deep into the Flashpoint story and get to know it inside and out. Then, take it and make it accessible to audiences who are being introduced to it for the first time. I get that it's not a direct adaptation because they wanted it to focus on Barry, but... This wasn't an origin story either. They included elements of it, but there's a way to incorporate a larger story without compromising the Flash being at the center. This movie is also just years too late. It could have done well in 2021 writing the coattails of Zack Snyder's Justice League. I liked that Barry more, and he was crucial to the story. I mean, without him, the world would have ended. 
There are references to Zack's Justice League in The Flash, which is interesting considering WB initially wasn't happy with his dark cut. So they brought on Joss Whedon to tweak things and basically babysit Zack, which led to him stepping away from the picture. Now they pretend Joss Whedon's theatrical release didn't even happen, which is crazy since it was years before DC let Zack release his version of the film. They did the same thing with David Ayer's The Suicide Squad and essentially replacing it with James Gunn's Suicide Squad. That right there encapsulates the issues with DC corporate. I just watched an incredible video from Dan Merle where he does his own Flashpoint spin on the DCEU and talks about what could have been done differently. If you want to check out that video, I'll have it linked in the cards at the top right of your screen. I have nothing against these people. I think they're extremely talented. But I believe the director and the writer were under-equipped to handle a film of this magnitude. A story that is so tangled up in deep lore. With Andy's horror background, I thought he'd include scary elements like David F. Sandberg did with Shazam! Fury of the Gods. Yes, I know that was a box office flop, but there were elements that I really liked. This movie was a bright departure from the dark world that Zack Snyder created, which I think worked in its favor. James Wan is directing Aquaman 2 out at the end of this year, so I'm not sure what is going on over there and their obsession with horror directors. I'm not saying that they're incapable of directing a big comic book movie, but something about it clearly isn't working when you look at the box office. Although, I don't think that's the director's fault. The criticism being thrown around now is the result of the amount of pressure put on this movie to do well. It was framed as a turning point for DC, the end of the DCEU, which is odd considering they're only releasing two more movies in the canon later this year, and then it's on to a whole new era. That type of word of mouth baiting only works if the movie is what you say it is. That combined with the insane campaign to overhype this movie to all hell, they will lose money on this movie. There's a long and complicated conversation to be had about Ezra Miller, but I will say this. They are talented, and I thought their past portrayals of Barry were cute, funny, and ultimately the reason The Flash was greenlit in the first place. But too much time has passed since Justice League. Their performance in The Flash was good, not great. Not what it was hyped to be. There were times where I felt he was completely checked out, and others, like the goodbye scene I mentioned earlier, where I thought he was at the top of his game. There's also something to be said about separating the art from the artist. But let me briefly discuss why Ezra is a unique case. I don't know how we got a full movie where he's in 95% of it all, considering the things he's been accused of. The reality is that it seems to me anything goes at DC. The execs have shown that they're easily swayed and will turn on a dime if they think something isn't working even in the slightest. They should have recast Barry Allen. Yep, I said it. They could have brought in Grant Gustin since he has portrayed this character for 11 years on television and has a devoted fan base. He's hot, he's good at his job, and he knows Barry Allen like the back of his hand. Okay, so you didn't want to go with a CW actor, fine. But there are phenomenal actors with more talent and charisma who are way less problematic. Ezra Miller's off-screen criminality played a part in how this movie has performed. Which leads us to this lingering question, why is Warner Brothers obsessed with Ezra Miller? I wish someone behind the scenes could tell me why he's favored by the bigwigs over there. I get that they put a ton of money into this movie, but they could have stopped while they were ahead because at this point, they're gonna lose more releasing it than if they would have just scrapped it. And speaking of scrapping, They were so quick to throw away Batgirl because they thought it wasn't good enough. That makes me believe now, more than ever, that Batgirl is probably a good movie, and the execs at the top just don't know a thing about taste or filmmaking. I will even go as far as to say they don't know what their audience wants and or they just don't care. I mean, what loyalty do they have to Ezra? Does he have something on someone? A silver bullet in the chamber that the bigs will do anything to stop? I'm just speculating, but I just don't get it. Warner Brothers was so quick to do away with Johnny Depp and Fantastic Beasts when allegations came out about domestic abuse. So it's kind of wild to me that despite all of Ezra's arrests and allegations, they kept them in not one of their franchises, but two. Insane. I don't know what's going on in their personal life, whether they're dealing with addiction, mental health issues, or both, but that doesn't insulate them from the consequences of their actions. 
People may forgive, but they do not forget. And the box office numbers are showing exactly why Warner Brothers never should have protected Ezra Miller as much as they have in the first place. Henry Cavill and Gal Gadot were supposed to appear in the final scene that they ultimately decided to cut out. In fact, the ending we got in cinemas was the third version of the ending. There was another featuring Michael Keaton and Sasha Kaye. I personally liked the reveal of George Clooney, but with it being such a last minute decision, it feels lazy to me. And if that was Gal's last appearance as Wonder Woman, I'm a riot. They had her doing that tired ass truth lasso bit once again, only for her to just fly off. She probably shot that scene in London right after her cameo in Shazam Fury of the Gods. Get that check, girl, and cash it before DC goes under. Speaking of cameos, the one cameo they could have secured was Linda Carter. Linda Carter is well known for playing Wonder Woman back in the 70s on television. She's a pageant queen, for God's sake. She played Principal Powers in Sky High, and she's an ally. Instead of focusing on the shock value of bringing back those who have passed, they could have utilized those who are alive and can consent. But knowing this production, they'd probably just have her come in only for them to sculpt her in post. Also, they make Barry seem so young here. The man has never had sex? He then goes on to meet his 18-year-old self, who is truly a virgin with his nerdy-ass laugh, so I don't know how old present Barry is supposed to be. You're telling me that Barry Allen, a hot man with a good job who doubles as a superhero, who could take my clothes off in faster than a second, can't get laid? Girl, bullshit. James Gunn strategically announced that Andy Muschietti will direct a Batman and Robin movie in the new DCU. This was a mistake. Don't announce something like that before seeing how the Flash movie resonates or doesn't with audiences. James, just stop. Just stop while you're ahead. Because even today, this man is babbing his big ass mouth, telling us who Superman and Lois Lane is going to be in a movie that's coming out in two years. In the past, we would have saved an announcement like that for, I don't know, maybe say Comic-Con. Yeah, we don't just blurt it out on a Tuesday. If I could rub a lamp and get my three wishes granted when it comes to the Flash, here's what I'd wish for. One, an animated Flash cameo. Especially since they decided to release this movie the same month as Across the Spider-Verse. It's a no-brainer. Two, I wish they followed the Flashpoint story more closely. They could have made sure it was mostly about Barry, while also giving us the most thrilling plot points from the graphic novel, which I'll talk about in a moment. And three, I wish they included more involvement from the rest of the Justice League. All of the members made a cameo, except for Cyborg and Green Lantern, because apparently he doesn't exist in the DCEU, <laughs> even though it's alluded to at the end of Zack Snyder's Justice League, and he shot that Martian Manhunter scene originally with Green Lantern. But the executive saw it and said, no, 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 change it to something else. <sighs> Lord Jesus. Now let's talk about 2013's Justice League, The Flashpoint Paradox. Disclaimer, I understand that this is a Justice League movie. This movie and The Flash, they're two separate things. I get it. But I believe that narratively, The Flashpoint Paradox did a better job at handling this story and adapting it from the graphic novel than The Flash did. Gather round as I tell you the story of Justice League, The Flashpoint Paradox. Our journey begins with Barry Allen, known to the world as The Flash. In a moment of quiet reflection at his mother's grave, he receives a distress call. The Flash Museum is under attack by a team of formidable villains. Captain Cold, Captain Boomerang, Heatwave, Mirror Master, and Top. Side note, there's a hilarious moment here where Top says, Once again, you're the bottom, and I'm the top. Bitch, we always knew Barry had a little limp wrist, but this confirms it. Jim Krieg, you're wrong for that. Love it. Back to the story. Ever the hero, Barry swiftly defeats them, but there's more to this attack than meets the eye. The Flash soon discovers that his arch nemesis, Professor Zoom, aka Reverse Flash, orchestrated this assault as part of a diabolical plan to destroy Central City. With the help of his comrades in the Justice League, the Flash foils Zoom's wicked scheme. However, despite the victory, Zoom's taunts about the death of Barry's mother continue to haunt him as he departs. Little does Barry know that his life is about to be turned upside down. The next day dawns and the world he knew is radically different. His superhuman powers have vanished, his dead mother is alive, and his beloved wife Iris 
is now married to another man. The Justice League is non-existent, and chaos reigns supreme. Across the globe, two mighty forces clash in a devastating conflict. Aquaman and his army of Atlanteans have submerged vast portions of Europe, while Wonder Woman and her Amazon warriors have conquered Great Britain and renamed it New Themyscira. Their fragile alliance crumbled when betrayal and murder tainted their relationship. One that once was dipped in romance. Okay. Cyborg, determined to bring an end to the destruction, assembles a team to quell the violence. He implores Batman to join them, but the Dark Knight's refusal results in the government resorting to drastic measures, enlisting pilot Hal Jordan to bomb the Atlanteans using an alien spacecraft. Amidst the chaos, Barry seeks solace in Wayne Manor, only to be attacked by Batman. However, he soon realizes that this Batman is not the one he knows not Bruce Wayne, but his own father, Thomas Wayne. Barry attempts to explain the inexplicable, revealing the truth about the altered timeline. It turns out that in this timeline, Bruce was the one shot in the alley as a child, and his parents survived. As he retrieves his uniform, a startling occurrence unfolds, the appearance of Professor Zoom's ominous uniform. Convinced that Zoom is responsible for this temporal upheaval, Barry manages to rally Batman to his side. Together, they embark on a perilous journey to recreate the accident that granted Barry his powers. However, tragedy strikes and Barry suffers severe burns in the process. Meanwhile, in London, reporter Lois Lane finds herself in grave danger, hunted down by the ruthless Amazons. Just as all hope seems lost, she's rescued by a local resistance group, breathing new life into her fight for survival. In the remnants of Paris, Deathstroke and Lex Luthor, while tracking the energy trail of Aquaman's destructive weapon, fall victim to the forces of the Sea King. Aquaman's weapon is powered by none other than the imprisoned Captain Adam, a hero turned tool of destruction. Back in the Batcave, Barry's reality continues to shift and morph. Desperate for answers, he implores Batman to recreate the accident one more time. This time, his powers are restored. However, Barry is unable to travel through time due to Zoom's manipulation of the Speed Force. Undeterred, Barry sets out to gather allies. Superman, once imprisoned by the U.S. government, becomes their first recruit. With the combined strength of Batman and Cyborg, they liberate the Man of Steel, empowering him with the sun's golden rays for the very first time. Confused and fearful, Superman takes flight, leaving the others behind. Overwhelmed by the ever-shifting memories and the strain of his quest, Barry collapses. He is taken to the home of Billy Batson, also known as Captain Marvel, to recuperate. It is here that he learns of Hal Jordan's failed attack and the imminent final battle between the Amazons and Atlanteans. In this universe, Hal Jordan dies before he can get the chance to become Green Lantern. Summoning the remaining heroes, Barry implores them to unite and put an end to the cataclysmic war. Together, they board Batman's jet, but their arrival in Britain is met with disaster as their aircraft is shot down. Emerging from the rubble, Billy Batson and his siblings combine their powers to become Captain Thunder, facing off against Wonder Woman. Simultaneously, Barry, Cyborg, and Batman confront Aquaman. Tragedy strikes once more when Wonder Woman mercilessly kills Captain Thunder, slicing him in his child form. All the while, Aquaman remotely triggers the Captain Atom powered bomb, unleashing a devastating explosion which will inevitably destroy the planet. In the midst of destruction, Zoom reveals himself, gloating over Barry's responsibility for this shattered timeline. However, Batman mortally wounded, makes a final stand and ends Zoom's reign of terror by way of gunshot to the head. He urges Barry to run, handing him a letter addressed to his son. Barry races back through time, knowing his mom will have to die in order to save the world. His actions only lead to another alternate timeline, a fresh wrinkle in the fabric of existence. As Barry awakens at his desk, he finds himself seemingly back to normality. Barry pays a visit to Bruce Wayne, Batman's true identity. He imparts the incredible tale of his journey, explaining that he remembers everything and that it must be some sort of time artifact. Barry then hands Bruce his father's letter as a token of gratitude. Bruce's tears drop slowly onto the letter. Wayne, appreciative of Barry's sacrifice, bids him farewell as the speedster dashes away. 
Yet, the story doesn't end there. In a post credit scene that sends shivers down our spines, a portal known as a boom tube opens in the vastness of space, unleashing a horde of formidable parademons upon the earth. And thus, dear listeners, we are left with the lingering question, will our heroes be able to face this new threat? Only time will tell. But one thing remains certain. The Flash, with his unshakable spirit, will continue to fight for justice, even in the face of unimaginable odds. That was a good story, wasn't it? I was watching and found myself shocked at every reveal, especially since the bitch was gory as fuck. I mean, Batman shoots reverse Flash through the head. Yeah, big old hole that they made sure you could see through. Oh, who is it? Hey, Batman. <laughs> Let's start with the story. In this one, Batman is Thomas Wayne, Bruce Wayne's father. I thought that this was a brilliant twist, since it makes sense why this version of Batman is so dark. His driving force is his son's death, and even though he's gone off the deep end, I mean, he's got red eyes. He's a Batman we aren't familiar with. This angle would have been so interesting in The Flash. I get why they brought in Michael Keaton, but instead of him playing his version of Batman, it would have been so cool to see him play this murderous, unhinged, grittier version of Batman that we got a glimpse of in The Flash, but that we'd be immediately connected to. Professor Zoom, aka Reverse Flash, is a great villain. He's in it just enough, and it still captures that your greatest enemy is yourself concept. Reverse Flash killed Nora Allen, but it now makes sense why. In The Flash, we don't know who killed Nora, which drove me absolutely nuts. You'd think that the person Barry would be searching for throughout the movie would be the murderer of his mother. That's what would drive him, but instead, it's left to theory. We get a little bit of Dark Flash, which turns out to be an older version of Past Flash, so we can deduce that the person who killed Barry's mother was present Barry, but in the future, when he finally realizes what needs to happen in order to save the world... <sighs> I'm exhausted. But that part is never explained. The antagonist in The Flash is General Zod, played by Michael Shannon, who's fantastic, but who didn't even want to do this damn movie. In The Flashpoint Paradox, there's multiple, with the main being the battle between the Amazons and Atlanteans. I think this would have brought the hype for this movie up a whole other level, as seeing members of the Justice League fight each other is always worth watching. It would also fit with the fighting within yourself theme. I will say that the story in The Flashpoint Paradox does need some preposition for the audience to understand what's going on, since a ton of characters are involved that we don't normally see in the DCEU. Captain Adam is introduced, who we know nothing about, but all members of the Justice League are included, even Hal Jordan, who dies before he could become Green Lantern. They haven't had this character in the DCEU, which is a, such a lost opportunity and a total mistake considering he's been a part of the Justice League for decades. I like that they introduced us to Supergirl and The Flash instead of bringing back Superman, but imagine how many people Henry Cavill would bring in if they chose to go that route. He would serve Steve Rogers before he got his powers, and I wouldn't be mad at bad CGI in that case. Better than photoshopping off his stash. Plus, they teased him returning at the end of Black Adam, only for James Gunn to announce that they had a meeting with Henry and let him know that he wouldn't be part of DC moving forward. Wild. Supergirl does have a moment in The Flash where she says, I've got you. A moment that parallels scenes in The Flashpoint Paradox where Superman comes to the rescue because he recognizes that Batman, Flash, and Cyborg are his friends after they break him out of the DoD facility. Some really sweet moments. They certainly tried to infuse parts of this movie into The Flash, but I think instead of throwing in small moments that parallel each other, they should have just taken more of the central story. I get that they molded it around Barry, but it could have been a much more exciting movie and maybe even live up to the crazy amount of hype that it's been given. Ultimately doesn't affect my bottom line as this isn't my movie, but I just wanted to take a moment to discuss what could have been. Two more DC movies are set to release later this year with Blue Beetle in August and Aquaman and the Last Kingdom expected in December. I don't know what lies ahead for DC, I just hope James Gunn takes a good hard look at the response of this movie and recalibrates. He's known for putting his work in front of people who he trusts and then tweaking things. So I hope he's navigating the future of DC with the help of those voices and his partner, Peter Safran, which will hopefully usher in a new era we can all be proud of.
The Flash is a sloppy, expensive summer movie that never gets it right. And despite the action sequences and deeply emotional moments, it still can't distract me from dreaming about what could have been. The reactions to this film are deeply visceral, as these characters are rooted in most of our childhoods, and it's upsetting to see them not handled with care. I'm giving The Flash not a fan. This is a scale designed by Dan Merle that is less binary and allows for nuance. It's also the scale I'm going to be using moving forward. Just because I didn't like it doesn't mean you feel the same, and it also doesn't mean that it's a bad movie. So go and see The Flash and form your own opinion. Print reveal coming right after this. If you were into this video, I got plenty more where that came from. Check them out right over there. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Make Cinema. Thank you for watching. My name is Jake Okoa, and may the power protect you always. I'll see you next time.